Hello, and welcome to another episode of Into the Scriptures. My name is Wesley Vital, and today's topic is about blasphemy. Now, we all have the understanding that blasphemy is bad. I'm pretty sure everyone has that understanding. And I think we can come to agreement that blasphemy is a no-go, okay? Blasphemy is something we should not be doing. But what exactly is blasphemy? What does it look like? I know a lot of people like to attach that word to certain situations that actually doesn't really apply. Um, for instance, and I'm just going to go, we're, we're going to start in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 6. But before we go there, if we just look up the Hebrew word, right, for blas blasphemy or blasphemed, if we look up blasphemed, it talks about to be re to revile, right? To revile. And to revile, and if you go to Westbrook Dictionary, to revile, it means you're criticizing in an abusive manner or you're insultive or insulting. And so we know just based on the definition, yeah, it, it's something bad. But what does that look like exactly? There's more than just it's bad, you're being insultive. There's so much more. It's a deeper understanding that I think we need to go through the word and, and see. And now the reason why I say that is because in the end, you won't believe. I know I, for me, I was kind of shocked with the connection that the scripture makes with blasphemy and your example. And that, for me, is why this study, or at least the understanding of what blasphemy is, is so important in our walk. So important. So, let's just start out with 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 6. Now, there's an individual we're going to start with. We're going to start with the uh, king of Assyria, okay? And king of the Assy Assyria, the scripture says uh, in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 6, that he blasphemed, uh, uh, he blaspheming, uh, blasphemed God, he blasphemed Yahuwah, and also in Isaiah chapter 37, verse 6. So let me just read these two verses real quick. So 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 6, And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus saith Yahuwah, be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria has blasphemed. Now, before this situation, we're going to read it, but before this situation, the king of Assyria sent messengers to the Israelites. Okay, this is after he, he conquered and, and all that. And he sent messengers because there was people saying that Yahuwah will protect them, that Yahuwah will be with them. They didn't like that. Period. So the king of Assyria sent messengers to pretty much put God in his place. Well, he intended that. That didn't happen. We're going to read that in 2 Kings 18. But the focus I just want to bring with this one verse is showing that the Bible is specific saying that the king of Assyria blasphemed, blasphemed our father in heaven, God Almighty, blasphemed him. And in Isaiah 37 verse 6, it says it again. It says, and Isaiah said unto them, thus shall you say unto your master, Thus saith Yahuwah, Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria has blasphemed me. So again, you have two verses, two locations, the mouth of two or three witnesses. Clearly the king of Assyria blasphemed our father in heaven. Now, let's, how exactly, right? How did he blaspheme? Now again, he sent his servants to deliver a message. So how exactly did he blaspheme? Let's actually read it. So in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 28. Now pay attention to how he, he's, he's, he, oh, just pay attention to what's being said because you're going to see that there's a clear denominator of what he's doing or what he's, he's trying to give as a message to these people. So in 2 Kings chapter 18, starting in verse 28, it says, and I'm sorry, I'm going to butch butcher some names, but then Rabshak, Rab Rabshak stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews language and spoke saying, hear the word of the king, the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in Yahuwah saying, Yahuwah will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand uh, into the hand of the king of Assyria. Now, before I continue to verse 31, notice that the messenger that the king of Assyria sent 
He wanted to make sure the Jews understood this, so he spoke in the language of the Jews, and he specifically told him, don't listen to Hezekiah who says to trust in your God. Don't listen to him. And don't listen to him when he says, oh, the, that your God is going to protect you against the king of Assyria. He's, so, so far, he's making it clear of do not believe Hezekiah. Do not listen to his message. And now we're going to get even deeper to what he says. So starting in verse 30, 31, hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus the king of Assyria make an agreement with me by a present and come out to me. And then eat you every man of his own vine and every one of his fig tree and drink you every one, every one the waters of his cistern until I come and take you away to the land like your own land, a land of corn, wine, a land of bread and, and vineyards, a land of oil, olive and honey that you may live and not die and hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth you saying, Yahuwah will deliver us. Now, before I continue 33, notice he's trying to tell him, I have something good. I have something good. Don't listen to Hezekiah. Your God is not going to help you. I can offer you. Make an agreement with me. Come to me. Come to me and I will give you vineyards. I will bring you to a land that's better. I will bring you bread and vineyards and olive oil and honey that you may actually live and not die. This is what the king of Assyria is saying. He's trying to take the place of God and saying God is weak compared to what he has to offer. Let's keep reading, though. Let's keep reading. We're not done. There's more to this message. So verse 33, hath any of the gods of the nations delivered out uh, or delivered at all his hand out of the hand of the king of Syria? Now, he just asked this question in this message to deliver fear and distrust, uh, distrust and doubt to the Jews by saying this. He goes, did any of the other gods, did any of the other gods of the nations help them out of my hand? No. That was a rhetorical question. No. Of those other nations fe fell to the king of Assyria. And that's what he's trying to say. He's putting doubt, make, ex exalting himself and putting the, the father in heaven, making him weak, making him weak. The king of Syria is boasting himself and saying, what other God is able to hold me up? Don't trust in your God. Let's keep reading. Verse 30, uh, 34. Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharim, uh, Hina, and Eva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand again? Sorry for butchering the words, but again, here he is bringing up the names of these gods and saying that these gods didn't even withstand me. Who delivered them out? Did they deliver them out of my hand? No, they didn't. This is a high-handed message. This is, a, this is, this is an ex, uh, exalting himself better, making God look weak. Let's continue. Verse 35. Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of my hand? that Yahuwah should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. But the people held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was saying, answer him not. This is what's crazy. Verse 35, he brings it up again, that what God in any of these countries, any of them, protected them against me, stopped me from taking their land. None of them. And then he even brings up, you, the, the father's name, it says that Yahuwah should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. Again, this is like a rhetorical question. Like, look at what I've done so far. You think your puny God's going to help? He blasphemed by how? How exactly did we just read here? He blasphemed by denying the power of God, denying his power, mocking him, mocking him, saying he's weak. He was weak. Look at what I've done. Look what I've done. Look what I can offer you and your God can't. And then he rejected the power of God, rejected him and made himself look more powerful, exalted himself, made him look more powerful than the God of heaven. That's how he blasphemed. He blasphemed by denying, mocking, rejecting and make, exalting himself, making himself more powerful. And again, by the definition of blasphemy, it means to revile, and to revile means to insult or criticize abuse uh, in an abusive manner. This is literally what he did, but he did it more with pride. 
This is pride of look what I've done. Look what I've done. This is a huge example for us to understand right off the bat what blasphemy is. It's when you deny the power of God. It's when you mock him, not just, and openly mock him especially, but when you mock him, and then when you exalt yourself higher, you exalt yourself higher, reject him, and say, forget you, look what I can do. Let's look up more. Let's look up another situation. So we have in Scripture, starting uh, Isaiah 65, verse 7. If we go to Isaiah 65, verse 7. We're going to see that the children of Israel also blasphemed God. Okay? Children, children of Israel also blasphemed God. So we have the example of the king of Assyria blaspheming God by making himself uh, more powerful, exalting himself by denying his power, by mocking him, rejecting him. Now let's look at how the children of Israel. So in Isaiah 65, verse 7, it says, Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith Yahuwah, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. So here again, we have the Israelites saying in Scripture that they blasphemed him. They blasphemed our father in heaven. How did, just like we did the king, king of Assyria, how did they blaspheme me? How did they blaspheme? How? Let's look up the actual situation that they did. Let's look it up and let's see if it matches what the king of Assyria did. Because there's, again, common denominator of how you blaspheme. blaspheme. So let's go to Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 27 and 28. Now these two is going to show, uh, uh, and there's more. We're going to do a couple witnesses here. But this first witness is going to show a little tidbit of what the Israelites were doing specifically. So Ezekiel chapter 20, starting verse 27 and 28, we're going to read. Therefore, son of man, speak unto the house of Israel and say unto them, Thus saith Yahuwah God, yet in this your fathers have blasphemed me, in that they have committed a trespass against me. For when I had brought them into the land for the which I lifted up my hand to give it to them, then they saw every high hill and all the thick trees, and they offered their sacrifices, and there they presented the provocation of their offering. There also they made their sweet savor and poured out their drink offerings. So what is exactly these two verses saying? So they blasphemed God, right? They blasphemed our Father in heaven because they committed a trespass against him. And a trespass is a sin. They committed a trespass against him. And how exactly? How exactly? That's where 28 came in when it said, when I brought them into land, then they lifted, uh, uh, the which I lifted up my hand to give it to them. Then they saw every high hill. So they were looking at the things around and they offered there their sacrifices and they presented the provocation of, the, of their offering. There also they made their sweet savor and poured out their drink offerings. This is idolatry, idol worship, giving these offerings and these things to the stuff they're looking at, the thick trees, the high hills. That's why when we read in Isaiah 65 verse 7, it says they blasphemed me upon the hills. They blasphemed me. And this is a trespass. They served another idol, giving offerings to the things they're looking at, uh, this land that the father himself brought them to. That's how, that's one of the ways they blasphemed him by denying him and going for something else, openly denying him and going for something else. Cause it was the father himself who brought him there. We all know what happened in Egypt. We all know what, we all know what happened at the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea. We know what happened in Sinai. And then when they get to the promised land, this is what they do. They saw with their own eyes and yet they still reject him. That's crazy. Let's look at some more examples, more examples. Psalms 106. Verse 6 and 7. Psalms 106, verse 6 and 7 shows again another thing they've done. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remember not the multitude of your mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Now, I love how they bring up the Red Sea. What happened at the Red Sea? We all know the story. I'm pretty sure we all know the story. At the Red Sea, they were boxed in, and the Egyptians were coming, but they were complaining. 
Egypt. There were some who was complaining and they complained about where they were, how it was better in Egypt, that we should go back to Egypt. Oh, did God bring us here so that we can just die? What? That's literally what they were doing at the Red Sea. Look, the Egyptians are coming. Did he bring us here so we can be slaughtered? That is the, a horrible, horrible attitude. That's why in scripture right here in verse 7 of Psalms 106, it says, but provoked him at the Red Sea. They tried to provoke the, they provoked him, provoked him. They didn't remember what he did in Egypt. They saw all those plagues, all those things fall on, on the Egyptians. And yet they still had the audacity at the Red Sea to say, oh, did God just bring us here to kill us? That's how they provoked him in the Red Sea. They, that's a mockery. That's an absolute mockery. Absolute mockery. It's horrible. This re- complete rejection of what God did for them. Complete rejection. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 14 now. Let's look at more. Let's look at most more. 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 22. 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 22. And Judah did evil in the sight of Yahuwah, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places, images, groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations, which Yahuwah cast out before the children of Israel. So, Again, they did evil in his sight. How? By serving other gods. By serving other gods. They even had sodomites. People who were also sodomites in the land. Like, come on, man. They know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet here they're doing it. They did ever. They said, it says in verse 24, 1 Kings chapter 14, they did according to all the abominations of the nations. Absolute. Everything the Father has done for this people Yet this is what they do. This is what they're doing. They are rejecting him, forgetting everything, choosing to forget everything he's done for them, everything he has established. They're saying, forget it. We want this. We want other, other, the idols. We, we want to do what the nations are doing. And that's what they're doing. A common denominator here, common denominator here is they're denying the power of God and they're rejecting him, complete rejection to serve idols. And what did the king of Syria do? Not only the king of Syria was making himself more powerful, exalting himself, but rejecting, absolute rejecting God and what he's done, saying, nah, no one can withstand me. He was mocking him. And this is mockery to this. The children of Israel also mocked God because the Bible says he bla- they blasphemed him by serving other idols, by rejecting him, by going away from him. And what's crazy is God specifically told them what they were to do specifically told them what they were to do let's go to it um it's uh deuteronomy deuteronomy chapter 12 uh starting in verse 1 and we'll go to 4 our father in heaven specifically told them specifically told them what they were to do and instead we're about to read instead of doing it they rejected it okay so check this out uh deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 1 these are the statutes and the judgments which you shall observe to do in the land, which Yahuwah God of thy fathers give thee to possess it. All the days that you live upon the earth, you shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which you shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and upon every green tree. And you shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire and you shall hew down the graven image of the, uh, images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of this place. You shall not do so unto Yahuwah your God. So here the father is saying, you will destroy this idol, idol worship. You will destroy it. The altars, the things on the hills, the high mountains, the trees, everything that is used for idol worship. And then he specifically tells them in verse 4, you will not do these thi- this to me. This is not how you're going to serve me. You are not going to worship the way they're worshiping these idols and these things. You're not going to do that to me. You're not going to do that to me. But what's crazy, what's crazy is they chose to turn from that. They deny, they have to deny his power to say, you know what? We're not going to listen to that. We're going to do our own thing. We rather do this. 
And that's exactly what ended up happening. They turned their backs on God. They, they rejected him. They cho chose to turn away. They denied his power, everything he's done for them in the past. They're denying it by turning from him, by doing their own things. All those wonders that he has performed for them in Egypt, bringing them to the promised land, they didn't care. They didn't care. They turned from him to do their own thing. To do their own thing. And what's crazy is just like the king of Assyria, they also exalted themselves. How did they exalt themselves? Isaiah 37, verse 22 to 24. Check this out. 37, verse 22 to 24. This is the word which Yahuwah has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised you and laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at you. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? And against whom hast thou exalted voice and lifted up their eyes on high? Even against the Holy One, even against the Holy One of Israel, by thy servants, Hast thou reproached the master and has said by the multitude of my chariots am I come up to the height of the mountains to the size of Lebanon and I will cut down the tall cedars thereof and the choice fir trees thereof and I will enter into the height of his border and the and the forest of his Carmel. This is the children of Israel openly despising him, mocking him, and claimed the power was of themselves. The powers of themselves. This is crazy. This is crazy. It says Jerusalem have shaken her head at you. Like verse 23 of Isaiah 37 whom has thou reproached now the word reproached means to mock or defame that's literally the word in Hebrew to reproach to mock or defame and then blasphemy to revile to criticize abusively to insult to exalt so when in verse 23 it says whom has thou reproached mocked defamed and blasphemed blasphemed that's a question mark what like who and against whom has thou exalted thy voice? And then it answers. It says, even against the Holy One of Israel. Against the Holy One of Israel. And it says they exalted their voice. And against whom thou has exalted your voice? Whom did they? And it answers in that verse. The Holy One of Israel, the Father. They exalted themselves above God. They despised him. They mocked him and claimed the power was of themselves. Exactly like the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria denied, rejected, mocked him openly, told him not to trust the power of God, and then said, I have better. And here's the Israelites doing the same thing, going to idol worship, rejecting God, turning away from what, uh, what they know to be right, forgetting what they're doing, going, you know what? I know he did this for me, but I did this. Look at the reproach they did at the Red Sea. They just saw all those things in Egypt, and look what they end up doing. Oh, God brought us here to die. That's mockery. That's mockery. These are great examples for us to understand, and probably one of the greatest, right? We just saw in verse 23 of Isaiah 37 the word reproach. What's crazy is you find this word reproach again, but it's actually a different uh, we're, we know what we'll see. It's actually a different word in this one. So in Numbers chapter 15, verse 29 to 31, the word reproach that we're going to read in verse 30, it actually in Hebrew means blasphemy, blasphemed. So when we read this, we're going to see something a little bit, a little bit more. So let's, let's just get into it. Numbers 15, 29 to 31. You shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance. Both for him that is born among the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. That's a good verse to show that the law was given to both, uh, both an Israelite by blood and also a stranger as well. Uh, let's go to continue on. Verse 30. But the soul that, that doeth aught presumptuously, whether he be born of the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth Yahuwah. And that soul shall be cut off from among his people, because he hath despised the word of Yahuwah and hath broken his commandment. That soul shall be utter, uh, shall utterly be cut off. His iniquity shall be 
upon him. Now, like I mentioned in verse 30, that word reproached, it actually means in Hebrew to blaspheme, to blasphemy. So this, this individual, okay, this individual, he would be cut off because what is he doing? He's doing aught presumptuously. He's, uh, verse 31, he despises the word of Yahuwah. He has broken his commandments and the soul shall be cut off. So again, this person is openly rejecting and on purpose, on purpose, uh, on purpose, going against any regard, right? like going against God commands, like on purpose. Now, why do I say that? The word presumptuously, check this out. The word presumptuously, presumptuously in Hebrew means high hand, a high hand. The, wor the word specifically means high hand, which means a bold or daring it means to deliberately, deliberately go against something. And in this case, it says, but the soul that doeth ought presumptuously. So they are going against openly, deliberately going against our father. He's going against, he's deliberately blaspheming, deliberately. He's deliberately doing it. And this is why it's important to understand about blasphemy, why it's so bad. You are deliberately going against God. You are openly rejecting him. You are m openly, on purpose, mocking him. This is disgusting. This is why blasphemy is so bad. And this is why, this is why when we read in like Hebrews chapter 6, let's go to it. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, and we're going to go to uh, 6. It says, for it is impossible for those who once who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. This is why. It is almost impossible. It is impossible for someone who has tasted the heavenly gift to fall away because they've seen all these things and yet they still reject it. That's someone deliberately saying, no, no, they tasted this heavenly gift. That's why in Hebrews chapter six, verse four says it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Possible. And verse six does give hope, though. It says at the end of verse 6, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now there's a verse that we're all familiar with is Matthew chapter 12, verse 31, where it says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy of against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Here's what's crazy. When people read that, they go, Why? The reason why we just talked about blasphemy, we looked up some examples so far of the Israelites and king of Assyria, and we also looked at Numbers uh, numbers uh, 15. It's there on purpose, mocking, rejecting. So it says all manner can be forgiven, but unto the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God is what changes that uh, an individual, is what is invited into us, into our hearts to change us, to make us into a new creature. It's the thing that puts his law in our hearts so that he may abide in us with his son. We are openly rejecting that. How can any change occur? I am deliberately saying no. I do not want his spirit. I do not want him, period. When it says all manner of sin and blasphemy, you know, like we read, some of the blasphemy that was being done is just open mockery. Open mockery. Uh, mockery, prideful, exalting yourself, but specifically open rejection, open mock, doing it on purpose, a deliberate, deliberately going against. If you apply that, the blasphemy going against the Holy Ghost and not be forgiven unto man, I understand why. Because the person doesn't even want it, period. They don't even want it at all. And it gets so much more. So much more. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. It says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifices for sin. 
How important for us to understand that. If we know the truth and we choose on purpose to go against, to go against it, to sin, there's no more sacrifice for sin. The Messiah sacrifice is not, is not on us anymore. We have to come to him and ask for forgiveness again. Again. How important it is for us to understand that blasphemy is not just bad, it's evil. It is evil. It is sick. It is twisted. You are open, rejecting, open mockery. All these things. All these things. There, there's just, when I look at blas- blasphemy in that manner, now when I see it, it's more. It's, it's, it's horrible. Openly rejecting and on purpose. On purpose. It's not just by accident. It's an on-purpose thing. And check that this is the biggest connection when it comes to our example. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, and we're going to read to 24. And this is when Nathan came to, uh, came to David and told him what he's done with Bathsheba, and it was wrong. Uh, it was sinful. Look at the response. So in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, it says, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against Yahuwah. And Nathan said unto David, Yahuwah also hath put away your sin. Thou shalt not die. So here you have saying, David asked for forgiveness, and Yahuwah forgave him. Check this out. How be it? Because the deed, because this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of Yahuwah to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto you shall surely die. Thou Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? uh, Thou that abhorrest idols, do you commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blaspheme among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. This is a crazy example. First off, you have David, how merciful our father is to accept to accept a, uh, uh, the, 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 the apology that David is making, the repentance to, to show him forgiveness, to give him mercy. But his example gave great occasion for the enemies to blaspheme God. The example of, you know not to commit adultery, but you did it. If you go against idols, do you go worship idols? This is what the questions he's asking. Do you boast and talk about the law, but then through breaking the law, you dishonor as thou God? Our examples in this walk, we need to be careful because our examples can give people to say blasphemy against our father, to mock him, to reject him. You know how many people I I, I talk to and they'll say, oh, I left, the, I left this church. I wanted nothing to do with God anymore because those people, they judged me and they said this to me and they did this to me. Is it God's fault that the individuals are doing that? It's not God's fault. Not at all. But because of their example, this individual doesn't even want to read the word of God anymore. How important it is our example because our example, we are responsible for giving the opportunity for our, the enemies of Yah, uh, the enemies of God, the enemies of, of the Messiah, we're giving occasion for the wicked to mock God, to blaspheme, blaspheme him, blaspheme his name, to reject him, to exalt themselves higher than him. This is what blew my mind, is that my example is so important. Especially if we know not to do something because it is a sin, because the scripture says, says it, and yet we do it, that can give occasion to someone to blaspheme. I can't tell you how many times I myself, we have a merciful, fa- merciful father. He will forgive us if we come to him with all our heart and repent and turn away from that sin. He will accept us just like he did here with David. And David, he didn't do no little thing. He didn't just commit adultery. He killed the man. He killed a man deliberately. But the father, he still got consequence for it, of course. But the father still forgave him. Still forgave him. Even though these things, I hear all the time, individuals, oh, you know, you say this, but, you know, in the past you did this. And 
I've heard people actually mock God doing that and say, oh, I had one person, he was a, a, an atheist, and he looked at me and he said, Wes, you struggle with this and you struggle with this and you always go through hard times and you, you curse and, and you always end up saying, hey, we should, we should keep the Sabbath or hey, we should follow this law, but then you do opposite when you're with me. I was young then and I didn't care at the time. But I would say certain things and I, I praise the father that he still came to me and still tried to win me and he won me. But at that time, I wasn't a good example. And because of that example, I don't even know what that person's doing anymore. I, 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 all I know is at the time of them saying that it made him not want God even more. Even more. He's like, look at this guy. He's, he's a hypocrite. He's a hypocrite. That's the best way to put it. And what's crazy is the Pharisees were hypocrites. They were boasting with their lips, praying out loud, making sure their garments are huge at the end there with their seats seats and boasting about how good they are and their righteousness, but their hearts are far from the Father. That's in Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, verse 7. It, te it tells us, You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people draweth not near unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines and the commandments of men. This is what the Pharisees were doing. They're hypocrites. And because of their example, they're giving other enemy, the enemies of God, the wicked uh, nations, everyone around them, they're giving them occasion to mock God to blaspheme God, to reject him, to deny his power, to exalt themselves higher. Just like how we read, just like how we read in 2 Samuel. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13 to 14, and then we read Romans chapter 2, verse 22 to 24. How important it is, how important it is that, our, that we, <laughs> we stay submitted that we stay praying, we stay searching the scripture, and we stay studying. Because what can happen is by our example, we give someone occasion to reject God, we give them occasion to mock him, and I know this is what the enemy wants. 100% the enemy wants an opportunity to take that. Because he wants to exalt himself higher than God. He wants to re you to reject God. He wants to take God's place. So this is what he wants. So this is what blasphemy is. Blaspheme, to blaspheme, is you being mocking him, rejecting his power, is you exalting yourself higher, deliberately, deliberately going against him, on purpose, on going against him. An example of that is if you read something in scripture that tells you not to do it, like for instance, like we read in Romans chapter two, verse twenty, uh, uh, Romans chapter two, verse twenty-two, should a man commit adult, uh, should a man say should not commit adultery, but then you commit adultery? That's right there is perfect. If you know the scripture says not to do it and yet you go ahead and do it. It's because you don't care. You do not care. You're denying it completely, just like the Israelites. They denied his word because they didn't want him. They wanted to do their own thing. Their own thing. And this is what blasphemy is. Blasphemy is so dangerous. It's absolutely dangerous. So I hope this study was a blessing to you. And I... I pray that you continue and study these things out for yourself. There's so much more examples when it comes to blasphemy. There's a lot more examples. I used the best ones that I liked because if I went through all of them, this would be a long study that we're having. But just off of the king of Assyria and the Israelites, we can establish what blasphemy looks like and what these individuals are doing, which is being high-handed, boldly going against God, uh, uh, denying him, rejecting him, exalting themselves. That's what blasphemy is. That's what it encompasses. And what's crazy is our example, our example can give individuals occasion or situations where they will blaspheme, blaspheme God. Hence why it's so important. So important that we wa examine ourselves, that we watch ourselves, whether we be a good example or a bad example. We need to pay attention with that. Hence why it like, just came to my mind. I remember in the scripture, it says when you're t uh, correcting someone, right? It says uh, when you look at the speck in your brother's eye, 
but look at the beam in your eye. Take that beam out of your eye first before you go and get the speck out of your brother's eye. Because what ends up happening is people go, oh my goodness, you're doing this. This is wrong. And then the other person is looking at you going, but you do the same thing. Or you do something worse than this. Get yourself, examine yourself first. Consider yourself, just like in Haggai. It says to consider yourself. Examine yourself. This, this is one of the biggest points I can make in this study is that we need to examine ourselves more because we have to be very careful that our example, our example can lead others to blaspheme God. And because of that, I even, even in my experience, I've seen people turn away from God and don't even want them because of that. And sometimes we do it without knowing it. And that's why it's so important to examine ourselves to be in prayer, to be studying the word so that as we read, we can find more truth. We can find more examples, more things to get a clear understanding so that we can grow. And this is what the father wants. So let's examine ourselves so that we not, we may not be found reprobates. How important is that to understand? And that's what blasphemy is. Blasphemy again, to be uh, uh, to exalt thyself, high-handed, reject, uh, rejecting God, denying him, mocking him, openly mocking him, uh, ex- uh, worshiping other idols, denying him completely in his word, deliberately going against, to revile, to insult him on purpose, abusively. So continue in scripture, look it up. Don't just take my word for it. Go look these things up. Go read the examples, learn more about this, And may Yah be with you in your study. Until next time, bye.